couple questions. Uh, who here is in mobile gaming? Like 20%. Um, anybody here have an Amazon Classic account? Like 5%. Okay. <clears throat> Who uses CloudFormation? 5%. All right. Uh, who has decided not to use CloudFormation or, dis or backed off of it? A couple. Yeah. I've heard of that a few times. Um, who runs multiple AWS accounts? About 20%, maybe 30%. All right. Any Aviatrix customers here? No. All right. Okay. Um, so, GRI is a mobile gaming company. When I refer to GRI, I'm talking about the U.S. subsidiary of the Japanese company. Uh, the company I work at, GRI International Entertainment, is in San Francisco. It's got about 200 people. The parent company in Tokyo has about 2,000 people. So GRI started using AWS in 2012, and over time from that start, from that starting point, has evolved toward immutable infrastructure. And continuing to evolve, but now towards more of a decentralized model on top of immutable infrastructure. So immutable infrastructure is kind of this idea in the broadest sense that you would never SSH into a machine that once it's done, you never change it. Now, you know, of course, you still SSH into machines, but the idea with it is that it's all instance-based. If there's, if there's an issue, you just respin the instance. You change the automation upstream. You never change the machine in place. That's the immutable infrastructure. So a little bit about GRI, um, their, uh, their business model. They're a, a publishing engine. So they'll have different games that they, that they publish, mobile games, first party games, uh, would be something that GRI produces itself. Maybe they, they typically would buy a studio, run it as a division. Sometimes they're second party games. It's where they commission a game, somebody writes it, a studio writes it to their specs. And then there are third party games where GRI might buy a game that's out there, that's, that's successful, that they pick up and they run it, they publish it. So a little bit more about GRI. It's sort of a, a publishing engine. It's got enough scale that it's, it's got four main kind of pillars. It's got marketing and analytics, live ops, which is the, the in-game events that you would find in a, in a mobile game. And in freemium games, these in-game events are, they're what make the money. They generate the revenue. So analytics informs the marketing. Analytics also informs the live ops. Live ops has to know which, which boss raids are popular, which ones are generating the revenue. And the last pillar here, of course, is tech ops, uh, which is what I do. And that's the AWS infrastructure. So the thing about these games is uh, they come and go. You know, there's a life cycle to them. They start out, they're popular, they get in the top 10 lists, and then they're not. And then you move on to the next thing. It's kind of like movies. You know, you scale up for something, it has a good run, and then, it, you know, it's, it's kind of over. It's not in the movie theaters anymore. So when you look at this as kind of a life cycle, you know, a game starts, and then uh, in Gree's case, for, a, say, a second or third party game, when a game starts to take off, when it starts to go viral or become popular, to have some legs, that's where GRI would come in because GRI has the mass to, to take the game to the top 10 list. That's kind of the goal of it, is to get into the top 10 grossing lists. So it's, it's, GRI is optimized for that. 
it's, it's optimized, you know, it, it takes a lot of table stakes to do the marketing to get people's attention for a game. You can have the best game in the world. You could, you could go home, you could have some friends, you could write a great game, but people don't notice it. You stick it on, you know, App Store, but it's just lost in the 10,000 other games. So to, to get it noticed takes, you know, marketing spend, the little, the little pop-ups on the, on the phones cost, you know, like a dollar each. So that could be, you know, a million dollars in one weekend just to, uh, to push a game. So you have to have the table stakes. And uh, so, you know, Gree's got all of that. Uh, it's kind of an engine for doing this. So back in 2012, when Gree got into AWS, uh, they, they, had, they bought a company called Funzio, a small studio. And they had three successful games. One of them was called Crime City. It's still out there. Uh, and this was all in AWS Classic. And originally, with the Funzio stuff, it was all EC2 instances. So they had their, their memcache clusters were on EC2. Their MySQL was, they, they did it themselves on, on EC2. They had Zeus load balancers. They weren't even using ELB. They were provisioning hosts using run books. So that started to change. Everything started kind of moving to services. Move the memcache to Elasticache and move to RDS and ELB. And GREE itself also made the migration, started using Puppet. Along the same lines, you know, Gree had dedicated job and cron hosts to run things, and Jenkins was introduced. Gree was doing tarballs, and then started moving to a packaging base. Originally, they did the analytics through EC2-based relay machines and uh, ephemeral storage. <laughs> Those were the days. Uh, and that migrated to Kinesis. Ran their own uh, EC2 Vertica. Now just use Redshift. Along the same lines, started using software as a service, uh, replaced uh, Elk, the Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash, Kibana stack, um, on e running on EC2. We had 150 Elasticsearch instances in EC2. Uh, it replaced that with Sumo Logic. Also, Nagios. It had Nagios originally. Switch to Datadog. And for networking, originally had SSH jump hosts and uh, some open swan VPN tunnels. <coughs> and switched that to Aviatrix. So in, in the old days with, with all of this, when we were talking about having everything on EC2, you know, the challenge was you know, keeping those memcache clusters up when there was a failover or, or the MySQL. Um, today, the challenges have moved to writing CloudFormation, updating Puppet, uh, doing monitoring, troubleshooting. It's changed from kind of a reactive system administration model to more of a, a DevOps engineering model. So just kind of an overview of some of, some of Greece stacks, some of the technologies. Not all of them, but uh, CloudFormation is very important to us. Uh, auto scaling is very important to us. We use a lot of S3, ELB, Kinesis. And with our partners, uh, Datadog, Aviatrix, Sumo, um, those are important to our stack. So some of the, the principles uh, that I can kind of out, outline here for our DevOps are to leverage software as a service. So that would mean you know, using Datadog or Sumo Logic or New Relic. Um, those are valuable services to us. Avoiding building things you can buy. Aviatrix would be a good example of that. Uh, infrastructure as code is, is one of my favorite kind of memes out there, uh, where you try to capture everything about your infrastructure as code. That usually applies to Puppet, but CloudFormation takes that a step further. And I would say leverage AWS services wherever you can. 
It doesn't make sense. It's sort of like avoiding building things uh, that you can buy if AWS has a service for it, like RDS or, you know, like Dynamo. Why run Cassandra? Why, why worry about that when there's Dynamo? Uh, automate everything. And as I said before, immutable infrastructure. And uh, one of my favorite little sayings is, uh, cattle not pets, servers are cattle not pets. Uh, and that's to say, you know, don't name your servers, don't, you know, feed and water them and love them. Uh, they're interchangeable. They should be immutable infrastructure. You should be able to shoot it in the head and keep moving. So for, for GREE, architecture at a high level design So each game gets its own VPC. But not everything fits within the VPC. There are some things like, you know, Route 53 or S3, AWS Directory Service, Code Commit, that aren't strictly within a VPC. Um, and what we've started to do is not only do we give each game a VPC, we now give it its own AWS account. And that's been really useful for the life cycle of a game. At some point it ends, and maybe you just end the life of the game, maybe it doesn't have legs, you, just, you can kill it. A lot of times, you know, for, for Gree, we'll transfer it to our parent company in Tokyo, uh, or even sell it off. So when you are handing something off, or even killing it, um, to have it encapsulated in its own account where you can find all the pieces, you know, shutting things down is one of the hardest things in ops. I don't, if there's any, if there's ops people here, launching thing is one is launching stuff is one thing, but shutting down a service is actually harder. Getting rid of something is hard. Uh, there's a lot of details. There's a lot of uncertainty. So when you think about the life cycle of projects and of games, anytime you can encapsulate and isolate things, it's a win. And we have found that moving to this model of AWS accounts and VPCs per game works really well. So what happens then, and I'll show a little bit over here. So these are kind of integration points. If you think about it, you know, you're doing your, your Git workflow, doing your check-ins as you normally would, and then the real reason to use code commit that I found is it's not, you know, it doesn't really compare to, to GitHub, but what we do is we sync to this. And then what happens is within the VPC, there's a Jenkins running that knows about this, about this code commit repo. And at the point where we transfer control, there is a new Git upstream of here that syncs to here, and the Jenkins never knows the difference. So when you hand it off, it's a clean integration point. Same thing with the AWS directory service. Same thing with, you know, it's, it's really great to have any sort of uh, domains and certs in, S3, in uh, Route 53 uh, because that can be handed off cleanly. That, that could be a mess trying to transfer domain ownership, but it's, it's very clean if you do it this way. And if you use S3, say, for all the packages that you've produced for your deployments, and you use S3 for your CD and origin, it's, it makes a very clean handoff. All you have to do at that point then is find something else that parks things in S3. Then you can hand that off to someone else, another division or another company. At a lower level architecture, if you drill down into, into that VPC, kind of the pattern here is you have a game engine up here at the top level, and it talks to some backend microservices, and they have some sort of data source. Um, we've been moving steadily towards uh, DynamoDB uh, because it's scalable, but it you know it takes some it takes some paradigm shifting a bit when when people are used to developing against uh, MySQL. But with this, you can get you know, your immutable infrastructure. Each one of these layers is auto-scaled. It's load-balanced. 
try to make it as stateless as possible. Put the state into the, uh, the backend database, the, and, and preferably a database service. And that makes for a clean architecture. And for us, the core of it is, when we're going to lay out a game, we're going to need Puppet there in the VPC, and we're going to need Jenkins, and we're going to need an AVHX gateway to peer it to the rest of our infrastructure. So at a high level, what it looks like, what I'm talking about here is, um, here you would have, say, Gree, and maybe I'm going I'm to do a, a little uh, use case for one of the games we just uh, purchased called Dragon Soul. Uh, but we peer that with an IPsec tunnel between these two. And we have external access for remote users um, using TunnelBlick for us. That's, that's the Mac client uh, for OpenVPN. But that's an SSL tunnel that uh, has uh, MFA authentication. Uh, and G it has GeoIP uh, too. We don't use that yet, but that's a, that's a kind of a newer feature that I would like to do. But once the uh, once the users come in through the OpenVPN, our network space is flat. All the VPCs that we're breeding now, uh, they're all meshed, and it's a flat IP space. So one of these users here can actually SSH out to here once they've authenticated and, and formed this encrypted tunnel. So one thing I want to touch on here was the patterns in 12-factor uh, app. Um, this kind of goes to the immutable infrastructure idea. It's a little more, bit geared towards devs, but it applies a lot to ops. And I find that it kind of gives a shared vocabulary to it. You know, when you look at an architecture, um, you know, what is a good architecture? What is, what is a, a manageable architecture? What is a reliable architecture? The 12-factor app stuff, it's kind of a manifesto, it, it captures, um, you know, what the attributes are. It, it does a pretty good job of that. So I want to kind of just, just walk through that real quick. Um, what that looks like. So the, it's based on, the, on, on some of the Martin Fowler's books, the uh, patterns of uh, enterprise application architecture and refactoring. So the first one is code base. And <clears throat> the short form is one code base tracked and revision control many deploys. And for us, we just use Git. Everything goes into Git. Our Puppet is in Git. Our CloudFormation is in Git. All of our Jenkins jobs that operate on the hosts are in Git. So dependencies, explicitly declare to isolate dependencies. That's, that's Puppet's area. You know, get all your packages and libraries defined and let Puppet manage those. Store config in the environment. So we use Puppet with Hyra data for that. We have config, public, uh, config templates in Puppet, and then uh, it's driven by the uh, environment-specific settings in Hyra data. Backing services. Treat backing services as attached resources. So we use Puppet with Hyra data to capture those endpoints. And this kind of goes into the, you know, the whole AWS services. Try to have managed endpoints for these dependencies. These, if, if you're not doing your own microservice, uh, then use a managed service. Build, release, run. So the idea there is to strictly separate build and run stages. So the way we do that um, is we use Jenkins to produce packaging artifacts. So uh, you know, make an RPM or make a Docker image. And, and use that for the basis uh, of your deployments and your provisioning. And we use uh, Jenkins Pipeline plugin to orchestrate the deployment. Processes. Execute the app as one or more stateless processes. So here, you know, you're just saying use ELB. And I, I want to bring in another idea here. 
uh, that I've run into, Stoneth. There's actually a Wikipedia page on it. And Stoneth is uh, shoot the other node in the head. And that basically gets back to the immutable infrastructure. If you have a problem with a node, uh, get rid of that node. Make a new one. Replace it. Fix it in your automation. Don't fix it in place. And you need to be able to get rid of any node. It has to be that stateless. And it has to be that automated that it just replaces itself. Export services via port binding. Some of these, they're interesting to read. Like there's a whole, you know, for each one of these manifesto points, I, I encourage everybody to check this out if, if you've never encountered it. Um, they go into depth about this. But I'll just say here, basically you're saying use ILB. Put an admin port on your service and make it private. That's a good use for ILB, which is the internal elastic load balancer. Concurrency. Uh, scale out via the process model. Uh, you know, use ELB and make these things stateless. You can, uh, you can scale it horizontally and they become interchangeable. Disposability. I think this is one of my favorite one. Uh, maximize robustness with fast startup and graceful shutdown. Um, this gets down to the whole Stona thing. Um, use auto scaling. Um, Obviously, custom AMIs if, if, you're trying to, if you're trying to get the speed of the replacement faster, if that's an issue. We've gone down that path in the, in the past. Currently, we're not doing as much custom AMIs. We're taking a little bit more of a hit to let Puppet finish the, the, uh, the provisioning. Uh, using Elastic Hash or DynamoDB. The reason for that is, you know, if you want this thing to be disposable, it needs to be stateless. If it's got state, it's not easy to dispose of. So, and I reference Stoneth again. But that's, that's, you know, key to it. Um, number 10, dev prod parity. So keep development staging and production as similar as possible. For this, you know, there's a couple of points here. Use AWS CloudFormation, use Puppet, and use Docker. You want as little daylight as possible between what people are testing and developing on and what you go into production with. A lot of times I find that devs focus on just the functions in their program. They, they're not thinking about the layers around it, like the endpoints or the fact that it's load balanced or maybe you have SSL termination to deal with. Uh, some of that falls out and sometimes you get a bad surprise with that. So uh, I will say that uh, uh, Docker is better than Vagrant for uh, minimizing environmental drift. Um, you don't get as much isolation, I think, with, with Vagrant. There's, there's certain things that kind of creep in there. Whereas Docker is a much cleaner way of uh, having a, a dev model exactly what's going to go into, um, into production. And uh, a note about CloudFormation. CloudFormation is great for um, creating sandbox environments. Um, what we do with our CloudFormation is we, we have fairly vertical CloudFormations. We do the whole stack. Um, I don't want to flip all the way back to the architecture slide, but if you look at like the game engine and the microservices behind it, we tend to put a lot into the stack so that that becomes a production stack. And then um, we can make a QA or a test or a dev or, or whatever sandbox that we want. We can actually clone those environments and then tear them down later. So that allows people a really clean, uh, high fidelity sandbox to operate in. Logs, treat logs as event streams. Um, we use Sumo Logic for that. We just stream uh, the, the the logs in real time off of the off the nodes, which is useful if you've got you know they're auto scale nodes. They're ephemeral. You better get them off of there because they can be terminated. And it's nice to have the analytics capability of Sumo, not just the log aggregation, but actually be able to do things with the logs in real time. Uh, admin processes, so run admin management tasks as one-off processes. This is a little abstract, but basically we stick all of that kind of stuff in Jenkins. That's how we handle that, and that's pretty clean. We've got it in Git. It's all upstream with version control and logging for the jobs that run. 
and easily findable. That's one thing with admin tasks. Sometimes they end up in some place you can't find them, and Jenkins is a, is a good place to keep everything. So some takeaways from all that is in that process over the last four years, kind of moving down those trajectories, we have gone from 14 DevOps engineers to currently have six. And we used to get hundreds of pages a week, and now we get around 10. So I would say the proof is in the pudding on some of this. Uh, as you get this stuff automated and locked in, there's less and less human touch. Um, the value add is, is definitely going up the stack for us. So talk a little bit about the VPC history at GREE. Uh, the first time we encountered VPC, as an AWS Classic customer, you know, we went years without touching any VPC. Um, we had uh, a game that needed to launch in Europe, and in Europe, there's, uh, they, don't, they, they don't have Classic, it's just VPC. So we had a really short time frame to get this done. We had like a six week deadline. So it was a rush job. Um, there's some poor choices were made. The, the, the idea was just get it working. Um, so that was our first foray, foray into VPC. Our second phase for VPC was, you know, there, there was a company mandate uh, to move from AWS Classic to VPC. This, this was starting to become an issue. There's, there's things that you can do in VPC that you can't do in Classic. Amazon definitely makes it worth your while to, they'll never kick you out of Classic, you can stay there forever but it's definitely better to be in VPC and we wanted to be in VPC. So that was a, that was, that was a mandate that, that Ops was supposed to, uh, to do. So we hired up, we staffed up for it. We said, well, it was kind of painful the first time, it was, it was rushed and people, we didn't have anybody who really had background in it. Um, let's, let's hire up for it. So we actually found someone who had experience uh, with VPC and networking, hired an expert. However, uh, you know, it was, it, the effort was like really over engineered. You know, six months in, we had this. Uh, I, I, my, my idea of a VPC is to have uh, a public and a private layer. Um, but uh, like the design that, that we had had four layers, so four layers of subnets. Um, and there, it was, there was a lot of kind of, you know, scope creep and, and uh, overreach with it. it. It ended up requiring, you know, redoing some of our, our, our automation stack to support uh, laying out new VPCs. So the time frame was really stretching out. And around that time, or six months into this, uh, the company had a big reorg. And as a 30% a riff, 30% um, layoff, and you know a layoff is serious when it actually hits ops. Uh, so we lost some guys there. All the guys who you know, were kind of doing the VPC thing, the networking thing, were gone. Um, so you know, we had a greatly reduced staff, and nobody left who was touching that stuff. So I got to tell our upper management, like, hey, the thing about the VPC uh, this year, we're going to have to take that off the table. You know, that was about, uh, you know, August of last year. And then last year at AWS, I, uh, I met the Aviatrix guys and got to talking to them. And it was interesting because they actually had a solution for this, uh, for exactly what we were struggling with. So a couple months later, uh, I got to go back and say, hey, you know that VPC thing? We got to figure it out. So we used Aviatrix to, uh, to kind of solve uh, the things that we were getting stuck on with, with VPC. So what I want to show you here is a quick demo, just a screen grab of setting up, how do you bootstrap Aviatrix? Um, basically, you know, you launch an instance for Marketplace, give it some creds, and uh, you have to, you know, configure it for what instance type you want. So let me just go ahead and, and, and play that. Launch an instance. Pick it from Marketplace. You have to bring your own license. It 
Choose an instant size. Choose a VPC, a subnet. Give it the role. This is this is the thing where you have to you have to give it the creds to do this to for that role. So it can do things, so it can actually launch things. So that's how you get started with it. It's really it's really simple. You you, you set up this thing called a cloud controller, which is sort of a, a GUI uh, for doing things. And and then when you're ready to, to you know, when you have your, your cloud controller, uh, for us, the most important thing was peering the, all these VPCs that we ended up with. Um, so let me, let me run that. This is how you set up a VPC with, uh, with a gateway. So this is going to launch a gateway. So assuming you're already in Oregon, create a new gateway. In a, in a VPC in US East. So basically, this launches a host in your other VPC. And once it's up, you can connect your Oregon uh, gateway and your US East gateway. That's what's happening here. And now it's going to ping between the two because it's done. So that's how simple it is to mesh your to mesh your VPCs. It's very clean, you got a, a single pane of glass, you know, just you come into this GUI, makes a nice little geo map of all the, all the tunnels that you have, all the, all the links that you have. So I want to talk about a, a use case uh, in, a, in a game that we recently purchased. I think this was in early October. Um, game called Dragon Soul, it's a, a freemium game from a company called Purblue. So this, this would be an example of a third party uh, game for, for Gree as a, as a publishing engine. Um, I went on site to do due, due diligence, talk to the, talk to the ops guys, um, and I got enough uh, privs, credentials to, to set up, um, to be able to launch a, a gateway. So I went back to the hotel that night and I did that, that gateway launch. And it was then meshed with the GREE space, which was nice because you know, I spent the day talking and going through their architecture and their operations. Um, and then later on, with less than an hour, I was able to enable all the people back at GREE to start poking at their you know, customer service tools and their uh, live ops tools as, as part of the, you know, the due diligence very simply and cleanly and securely. So here's the game. It's one of these. So for this, for this game, the original deployment looked like this. This is kind of a little bit simplified, but not, not too far off the mark. Um, They gave us the AWS account. It was in a single VPC when they sold it to us. And it, was, it, it is not a 12-factor app. Uh, it, it fails on a lot of, a lot of things. Um, so the world servers are, are not auto-scaled. They're not redundant. The game connects directly to them. Um, and they have some back-end services. And these are literally a single machine for the payment processing and the ad serving. Uh, if these go down, the game's down. If this W1 goes down, World 1 is down and none of those players can play. So the first thing we did, this was when I, when I went out, was added a gateway here so that we could access this. So what that looks like is over in Greece space, uh, slides a little off. But for this, basically you're taking one VPC, connecting it to another so that you can uh, transit traffic. And what that allows us to do um, is 
build out a second VPC. So using Aviatrix, uh, what we want to be able to do is, you know, a couple of goals here. We needed to do kind of a, a California remodel, which is you have the existing game, knock down three walls, replace them, then knock down the fourth wall, and then there's nothing left. So in that process, what we do is we spin up a second VPC and mesh it to the first VPC, the, the original VPC, so that we can use, still use, say, the payment services and the ad tracker, but we can start building out things a little more robustly. We start splitting things out. We start putting, you know, say, an ELB in front of each world server. There's actually multiple World 11 servers for different, we do different deployments so we can do uh, same cutovers. Um, and we start, we, we had some, uh, some of the things that we were solving for uh, were uh, single points of failure, as I mentioned, and we also had some capacity issues with the, with the back end, so we're, we're having to shard the databases on the fly. So going forward, shard 11 uh, should be on its own Aurora RDS. Um, and you know, that stuff should be fixed, uh, you know, those performance problems and whatnot, but uh, it takes time to, um, to unwind, you know, a stateful architecture. So the, the goals were with this thing were to, uh, you know, we wanted to grow the game. We bought the game for a reason. We want to double that game, triple that game. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to rock the boat with the existing infrastructure. The, the existing game has to keep chugging along. All right, so in summary, uh, I had a couple of uh, ideas here. That you know, DevOps is not just technology; it's it's people using technology. It, it's one of the big things about all of this is that um, you know what's important in business for us is is continuity and uh, choosing your technology wisely uh, means that your, your your team can support it. It's not just like you have a special go to person for for everything or or certain special things. Uh, let me let me go through some of these. Um, Docker is great, but it has some sharp edges. Uh, we're getting a lot of mileage out of Docker. We use it basically as a, as a, as a better package. But we've also had some surprises, mostly around Docker networking. We've had some uh, great learnings. So, uh, you know, tread lightly. Uh, CloudFormation is great, but that was a really steep learning curve. Uh, <laughs> that was pretty painful. But now that we're there, we're really happy with it. Uh, use dedicated AWS accounts, sub-accounts. Uh, we, you know, we have a main account. We roll all the new accounts into that, it's, so it's all consolidated billing. Um, but that has, has really helped with our business flow. Uh, for us, you know, and, and I think maybe this could apply to people who aren't in games, I mean, for projects, but things have a life cycle. And being able to isolate things and encapsulate things is, is valuable. Uh, we found uh, Aviatrix to be uh, super useful as, as we kind of go down this path. It's, it's one of the things that was, was holding us back. And so we, we found the Aviatrix solution. It makes it really easy to mesh everything and flatten it out and, and do it securely. A um, little... Uh, philosophy note here that people leave and institutional knowledge is lost, so capture everything in automation. Sometimes people say, oh, that's not worth automating. We don't, you know, we're only going to do that initially when we, when we you know, have a certain operation. Uh, you know, it's, it's fairly rare. But that's actually a good thing to automate because in automating it, you've kind of documented it, kind of captured it. Uh, and... Uh, Kind of related to that is that people take shortcuts and, and magic happens. Uh, so even if even if like you know there's a reason to do that, like you're under the gun, it's good to you know enforce the automation, go back, circle back, get that thing automated, captured, so that you can reproduce it. Basically, you know the the if it's automated, you can shoot it in the head. You can reproduce it without a lot of fuss. Is, is what I would say. So thank you, that's all I have. Um, I will take questions if anyone has them.